Okay, so nested for loops are a for loop inside another for loop. So going back to the basics of the for loop, all for loops start off with the word for, and you have a variable name, a start, and a finish. That's pretty standard. We just did a whole bunch of those. Okay. Now, when we first talked about for loops, I said, you know, all your for loops are going to have this kind of form. And then inside the for loop, you can have any kind of code you want in here. Now, when I say any code, it could be a single command. It could display stuff to the screen. It could make a little calculation. It could be an if statement. It can be an entire uh, hydrological model that could be in this for loop. Anything can go in here, including another for loop. So the way this would work without, you know, if nothing going on here besides just what you see on the screen, you have this outer for loop. So you'd start here. And you'd set i equal to 1. And then you'd go do all the code in here that with i equal to 1. So we'd do whatever this code is, we'd repeat that as many times as the inner for loop wants to go. So you can kind of treat this code inside as completely independent from the outer for loop. It just happens to know that i equals 1. So whatever code you're running in here, what did I do? OK. So I'll zoom in here. So whatever code you're running here on this inner for loop is completely independent. So you could be, for example, here uh, calculating the total weight of your carrot farm. just so happens we have 10 carrot farms. So the outer for loop for this case could be each of our 10 carrot farms. Let's make some notes here. So this is our, this is the farm that we're working on. This is the total number of farms. So we're some big industrial carrot producer. We have carrot farms in every state. So we want to go to the first farm, the farm in Washington, for example. So we'll call that farm one. So you go to farm one. Now we go through here and we figure out what the total weight produced by farm one is. So you go to each garden plot in carrot farm number one, figure out its total weight. So this for loop is going to be just like we just did with our carrot farm example. Once we're done with, with figuring out the total weight of carrot farm one, back out here. Now we repeat this outer for loop. We go to carrot farm number two. At carrot farm number two, we go through and calculate the total weight of all the carrots produced at carrot farm number two. Once we're done with that, back out here, repeat the for loop again, go to carrot farm number three. Is everybody kind of seeing how that works? So your outer for loop and your inner for loop don't necessarily have to be related at all. So in the, in the case I was just describing, the outer for loop is going to each carrot farm. You go to the one in Washington, figure out its total weight. Figure out the one in, or go to the one in Oregon, figure out its total weight. Go to Arizona, figure out its total weight. So the inner code is everything we just did with our uh, carrot farm example on the screen. That's, the, that's this inner for loop. Let's put another circle around it. Why not? The outer for loop is taking that piece of code that we do at each carrot farm and taking it to all the different carrot farms to do it. OK. So that's kind of a nice overhead view, I think, of what nested for loops could do. 
I want to do another kind of more real world example. I usually do this example in the classroom and I get a lot of exercise because I walk around the classroom and point at things and use what's there in front of me. I'll have to do that kind of as a drawing instead here today because obviously we're not in a classroom. Um, I'm going to do a little drawing of what our classroom kind of looks like. So in our classroom, the one we'd normally be in, we have three tables. There we go. On each of those tables, we have eight computers. Okay, so up here is the whiteboard. And back here is the door, somewhere in that area. That's our classroom. Here's where I usually hang out. Okay. Actually, I'm going to get rid of where I usually hang out because that actually adds confusion to what I'm trying to say here. So I'm usually hanging out up in the front here, and you guys are usually hanging out at these computers. So to kind of do a just a single for loop example first, let's say I want to go through and take attendance in the class. So one way I could do it is just go through and count people. The other way I can do it, I can kind of break up the problem a little bit and count people at each desk. So there's three, three desks. So that's going to be what my for loop is going to go through. So for D equals one to three to the three desks. Now my attendance, I'll call it A, is just going to be an array. So attendance at the first one So attendance at each desk is going to be equal to whatever my count is. I'll call it count. And so the way it'll look is like this. So first I'm going to stand at desk one. So I'm standing here. Then I'm going to count how many people are at the desks. Okay. So now I go through. I just put put people in class. Uh, decent attendance for the day, I suppose. Okay. So at desk one, this is me standing here at desk one. I'm going to count how many people. I see six. So my count will be six for A sub I. Next, I'm going to move myself over here. Now I'm at desk two. Let's put numbers on these so we keep track. So I'm at desk two. Now I'm going to count, count at desk two. I count eight. Okay. Then I go to desk three. I'm here. And I count seven. So now I can finish taking my attendance. I can take the sum of what's in A, and that will give me my total attendance, which is 21 just for laughs. Okay, so that's kind of a standing real world example of what a for loop might be able to do. So my for loop, D in that for loop was the desk that I was currently looking at. So this D was keeping track of where I was standing. So I was standing D equals one, D equals two, and then ended up at D equals three. All right. This is so slow. 
The iPad's working really slow today. I don't really understand why. Anyway. Okay. So let's make this example a little more complex so that we need to do a few more things. So now I'm going to set this up where I'm going to pick a variable. I'm going to call it status. When it equals 0, the computer is off. When it equals 1, the computer is on. When it equals negative 1, the computer is busted. That almost worked. Pretty good. Okay. So I'm going to go through now. I'm going to mark each computer with some kind of a status. Okay, so I got two broken ones. That should work. All right, so now my for loop's going to work a little differently. Because now, not only do I want to go to each desk, I want to go to each computer on each desk. So in order to do that, I'm going to have to work my way through both things. So we're still going to have, let's see, can I make all this fit? That's the question. Everybody still see what's going on in the classroom here? The uh, picture of the classroom, I should say? Yeah. Okay. So here's what we'll do. First thing I need to do, I'm going to set up my first for loop. I'm going to go from, go to each desk. So go to start at desk one, go to desk three. So I'll start here on desk one. Once I'm at desk one, now I want to go through each computer and see what its status is. So I can kind of build a little array somewhere here where I can fill in all these statuses. So this is D. The D is going to be the desks. There's three of those. And then um, that's going to be the rows. The columns will be the individual computers, which will eventually be called C. Okay, so now we can, for a minute, we can forget about this for loop and we'll just think about our inner for loop. Okay, so now we're going to go through and we're going to check the status at each computer. Now don't go trying to put check status into your MATLAB and make this work. It's not going to work. We're doing a walking example. Uh, imagine we're sitting back in a classroom where we all belong, and I'm walking around yelling at you like I am right now. Not yelling at you, just yelling in general so you can everybody in the room can hear me. OK, so I, I'm at desk one. Now I'm going to go through each computer at desk one. So I'm going to start off with computer one, and I'm going to figure out what its status is. It's on, so it gets a one. Then I'm going to go to computer 2. It's on, so it gets a 1. Then I'll go to computer 3. It's off, so it's going to get a 0. Computer 4 is on. Whoops. So it gets a 1. OK. Computer 5 is on, so it gets a 1. 6 on gets a 1. 7 on gets a 1. Then 8 is broken, so it gets a minus 1. Okay. 
So I just went through this for loop. I went to each computer, checked its status, and then I noted it down in this big array here. I think I was like a rewrite that a little bit. I call this array S for computer status. And then this would be S. Oh, hold on. I got to rewrite some things right here. Give me a second. So S, desk, and computer. So desk is the row, computer is the column, is going to be equal to my status check. OK. So that's what we just did there. OK, so that finished desk one. Now I need to move to desk two. So we're back to the outer for loop here. Or now I'm going to move myself from desk one to desk two. This iPad is working really slow. Okay, so now I'm at desk two. So that's our second row in our array. And now at desk two, I'm just going to do this inner for loop again. So I don't really need to worry about the outer for loop. I just need to worry about the inner for loop. So I'm going to go to computer one. It's off, so it gets a zero. And then computer two, it's on, so it gets a one. Computer three is on. Computer four is on. Five is on. Six is broken, negative one. Seven is off. Eight is on. So that completes my cycle through that for loop, checking the computers at the end of, at that desk. So now I move again to desk three. Now I'm here. I'm going to go through, again, this inner for loop. So the outer for loop is moving me from desk one to two to three. The inner for loop is the one that's taking me around each desk and getting these numbers. So now I'm on row three. I'm going to check desk one. It's on, two, on, three, on, four, on, five is off, six is on, seven is on, and eight is off. Okay, so that completes my for loop. So the outer for loop just went one to three. It went here, here, and here. The inner for loop goes to eight. It goes here, 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 and here. And then we take that piece of that part of code and move it to each individual desk. That's really all there is to nested for loops. Now I will say that this tends to be one of the more difficult concepts for beginning programmers to grasp is how the inner for loop or how the nested for loop works. Um, so I'm trying to show that it's actually much simpler than a lot of times you're going to try to make it. Just keep in mind, one of these loops is moving a lot slower than the other loop. So this outer loop only moves three times. Each time it moves, the inner loop moves eight times to go to eight different locations. So the way you might use something like this is when you have um, you know, a larger group, or you have a small group of groups, basically. So we have three tables. Each one has eight different things inside the table. So one for loop is going to take you from each to, to each table. Another for loop is going to go through the individual pieces of that table. Now, normally here, I'd ask for any questions, and I will. I'll ask you for more questions, but I think I'll, probably many of you are not even sure what to ask. So I'll take a moment to have a little aside here.
we'll talk a little bit about the learning curve with programming. The learning curve looks kind of like this. I've, I've talked about this before. So early on when we're learning about variables, we're learning about uh, how to do simple arithmetic and things like that. The learning curve is pretty shallow. Then we start getting to arrays. Things get a little more difficult. Then we start getting if statements. Things are a little more difficult. Then we get to for loops. Things get pretty steep at for loops. Then we get to nested for loops. And things get real steep at nested for loops. That's where we are now. We're on the steepest section. This is the hardest part of beginning programming. So we'll label this plot here. This is the easy stuff. That's the beginning stuff from the beginning. This is arrays. Still not too hard, but getting harder. This is if statements and conditions. This is for loops. And this is where we are now, for loops within for loops. After that, once you grasp nested for loops, The learning curve goes like this. Everything else gets a lot easier. Because once you have that, everything else is just kind of starts to fall together. So uh, know that I'm aware that we're in the hardest part right now. So if you don't have questions, it's not necessarily because you get it. It's because maybe you completely don't, and that's fine. We're going to try to get there by walking through things one at a time. OK. So let's do a somewhat more useful example that we can actually plug into MATLAB. So here's something we've seen before. So if I wanted to take, if I want to calculate the sum of this matrix, of this array, I would do it like this. Okay, so that's how I would calculate this sum. Okay, we've seen that before. This is, again, this is a typical recipe here that you can use to calculate the sum of any vector. I'm sorry if my handwriting is looking really bad. I'm having, I've already said it, but I'm having problems with my iPad being slow. I write something and it doesn't appear on the screen until a few seconds after my pen goes away and then it shows up. So if I overlap or have bad handwriting, so I can't really see what I'm doing. I'm trying, trying to get it to work, but I actually don't know enough about iPads to fix it, which annoys me because usually with my own computer, I know how to fix everything. At least know what to look for. Okay, so now we want to move this on to, so we did vectors. This is for one dimensional arrays. Now we want to look at arrays that have more than one dimension. So we're going to call this one M. And we're going to look at something like this.
Okay, so we've got this matrix M, and we want to find the sum of this matrix. That's not going to work using this recipe for the sum of a vector, because if you take the length of M, this is going to give you the length of the longest dimension. So M is 3 by 4, so length M is going to give you 4. We have 12 elements in this matrix that we need to put in our total. So having this go to 4, not going to be enough. So we got to look at this in a different way, first of all, before we can start getting through it. So what we need now is to get both dimensions. So we can do that using the size command. Okay, this is going to give us two variables. One of them will be row, and that's going to be, in this case, three. And then one of them is going to be call. In this case, it's going to be four. So I'll just kind of make a note what those would be for our example, three and four. Okay, now we still want to go through and total this up. So that's the next bit. We'll have our total. We'll initialize it to zero, just like before. So this is going to be exactly the same. Total is initialized to zero. But now we need to walk through this. So with one dimension, we just had one for loop. Now we're going to have more than one. So here's, here's how we'll go. The first for loop is going to go through the rows. It's going to go from one to row. So Let's just make some notes on here. So i is equal to our row index. Okay, so now we have a for loop that's going to go through all the i's. So it's going to go, so it's going to start at one, two, and three. That's going to take us through our rows. But now we need to go through and get individual numbers. So our I loop is looking at these one at a, entire rows at a time. But we want to actually do the addition here. So we need to actually look at these individual values as well while we're going through it. So we need to see these guys. So to do that, we're going to have another for loop. Okay. So now this inner for loop, again, when you have an inner for loop like this, the outer for loop is going to take you to one spot. The inner for loop is going to actually do all the work there. So we can kind of, once we're into this inner for loop, we can ignore the outer for loop for a minute. The inner for loop is going from one to column. This is our J's. That's J equals one, two, three, and four. Now, a very common error people make here. It's more of an error in conceptualization with this. So I, the outer for loop, I is going through each of the rows. The inner for loop, J, is going through each of the columns. But you're not looking at entire columns. So you're not looking at this when you're going through your J loop. You're not looking at column, column, column. What you're looking at is just where that column intersects your current row. So you're looking at column, 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 and column. You're just looking at the intersections, which is great because the, where those intersect, it's just one number. Right? So now when it's time to take your total here, so it's set up just like, oops. Just like it was with the vector, there we go. Total equals total plus. We have an I value, that's our row. We have a J value, that's our current column. That's where the two, where the row and the column intersect. 
I and J refers to individual numbers in the array. So now we're getting our total here. And that's it. So the outer for loop takes you to each row. The inner for loop goes through that row and looks at each individual number and adds it here. So let's walk through this one thing at a time and calculate what our total is going to look like. So numbers we're going to want to keep track of as we go through our code here. We're going to want to keep track of our total. We're going to want to keep track of our I value, our J value, and our MIJ value. So our I value, our J value, and our current location value, MIJ. OK, so before we start, we know what our total, our initial total is. We're going to initialize the total to 0. OK, now we're going to start the outer for loop. So for i equals 1 to row, so we start off at i equals 1. OK, now we're done with the outer for loop for a minute. We can just concentrate on the inner for loop. So the inner for loop, we're going to look at j. So j goes from 1 to column. So we're going to start with j equals 1. Now we want to find out what mij is, this value here. So we have a row index. We have a column index. That's what i and j are. So we can go look at our matrix over here, m, and look at, so i is 1, j is 1. So we want to find m11. That's 2. OK. Now we're going to actually look at what we're calculating here. So total equals total plus mij. So we look up what our total is. It's 0. OK, we look up what our total is. It's 0. Then we add mij. That's 2. So 0 plus 2 is equal to 2. We save that back into total. So our new total is going to be 2. So save that back into total. That makes our new total here equal to 2. Okay. Now, we're still just in this inner J4 loop here. So now we're going to continue that for loop. Now J is going to equal 2. Okay. So now, I didn't change because we did not go out to the outer for loop yet. We're just we're going to finish this whole inner for loop before we even look at the outer for loop again. So I is still 1, but now J is 2. So MIJ is M12. That's going to be 1. So uh, MIJ is going to now equal 1. Total plus MIJ, that's 2 plus 1, is 3. We save that back into total. So now our total is 3. All right, now we repeat the inner for loop again. So now j is going to be 3. And then we look at m13, which is 3. Then we take total plus mij. So 3 plus 3 gives us 6. And that's our new total. OK, now j is going to be 4. Okay, So now j is 4. So we look at m14, which is 9. 
And we take 6 plus 9, which gives you 15. So now our new total is 15. All right. Okay, so there are four columns. So we just got all the way through the inner for loop. So we've got all the way, and we've totaled up to 15. Now, when that for loop's done, we finish and drop out here. And now we're at the end of the outer for loop. So now we're going to repeat the outer for loop. So now i is going to be 2. So now i is 2. And then we're going to go back in here, and we start this inner for loop again from the beginning. So now j is 1 again. OK, so now we look up m21, which is 2. Oops. So m21, that's 2. We add it to 15. So total is 15 plus 2 gives us 17. So our new total value is now 17. All right. Now we're going to um, advance j. So now we're j at j equals 2. Then we look up M22, which is 5. OK, now we add 5 to 17. So 17 plus 5 is 22. And that becomes our new total, 22. OK, now we go to J equals 3. We look up MIJ. So M23, which is 4. And we add that to 22. So 22 plus, plus 4 gives us 26. So now we're at 26. Then we go to J equals 4. Then we look up uh, M24, which is 0. Um, M24, which is 0. We add that to 26. We get 26. OK, so that finishes the inner for loop again. So we go back out to the outer for loop and cycle that through again. And now we're going to be at i equals 3. So now i equals 3. And then we do the j loop again. We start at j equals 1 again. OK, so now we look for m31, which is 8. OK, and we take total, which is 26 plus 8, gives us 34. So this becomes 34. OK, then we go to j equals 2. OK, so we look at m32, that's 7. So we take 34 plus 7 is going to give us 41. Oops. So 34 plus 7 will give us 41, right? Yeah. All right. And then J, we go to J equals 3. So then we look at M33, which is 2. So Mij is 2. And we add that to 41. So we take 41 plus 2 gives us 43. And that gives us our next number. And then j goes to 4. And you look at uh, m34, that's 0. So you take 43 plus 0, which is 43. And then we finish the j loop. We've also finished the i loop. So now we're outside. We have a total, which equals 43. All right. So everybody kind of follow along how we 
how we got there, we walked through that array. It's very similar to how we walked through the, the vector, but in this case, we basically treated it like we were walking through three different vectors. So let's take a quick look at the code side by side for a two-dimensional array versus a vector. So give me a second, I'm gonna rewrite both of them side by side down here. So vector first. Okay, so that's a vector, the sum of some of the contents of a vector. This will be some of the contents of a two dimensional array. Go away. I do a little cleaning because of my major computer issues I'm having here. Oh, for some reason that won't go away. Well, we'll just have to work around it. Okay, so now we've got two pieces of code that do, one of them calculates the sum of a vector. One of them calculates the sum of a two-dimensional array. Now, you might notice that they're very similar and have just a couple of minor differences. So one part that's similar but different, we're getting the dimensions of both of the arrays. We have to use a different command to do that because the length of a vector is just the total number of values in the vector, but the length of a 2D array is the longest dimension. But we want the full set of dimensions. So for a 2D array, we need to use the size command and we need to save both dimensions. Both of them start by initializing a total at zero. Then both of them have a for loop that goes through a dimension. Where they diverge a little bit is our 2D array 
as a second for loop to go through the second dimension. The calculation is generally pretty similar. However, the value that we calculate oops, has a slight difference. We use two array indices for the two-dimensional array. So here's the difference. With a one-dimensional array or a vector, we have one for loop and one array index that becomes important. With a two-dimensional array, we have two for loops and two array indices. Now, it's possible to have a three-dimensional array. So if you had a 3D array, what do you think would be different between these guys? You'd have three for loops and three array indices. If you had a 10-dimensional array, besides being crazy, you'd also have 10 for loops and 10 array indices. So all that kind of comes into play in your command where you get the dimensions. If it's a one-dimensional array, you just have the length. If it's a two-dimensional array, you have rows and columns. It turns out the size command will work on any dimensional array. So if it's a three-dimensional array, it'll return all three dimensions. If it's a 10-dimensional array, it'll return all 10 dimensions. You just put them in the order that you want to receive them and give them these variables. Now, you're not often going to see anything greater than a four-dimensional array, probably not greater than a three-dimensional array. And in this class, two dimensions is about all we're going to deal with. But I do want you to be aware that a three-dimensional array is possible. And the only thing you'd have to do differently to get the sum of a three-dimensional array is add in another for loop to get through that dimension and add in another array index. So just for fun, I'll show you what that would look like real quick. I'll just write out a quick piece of code here for a 3D array. I'll call it T for three dimensions. There you go, that's a three-dimensional array. So just take a quick glance at these two codes for 2D and 3D, and you'll see they're not much different. In fact, the part that's doing the bulk of the labor for any of these is almost exactly the same as total equals total plus A part. Doesn't really change. So we could get our total, this is the sum of all the values in the array. So this is going to give you 2 plus 7, which is 9, plus 9 is 18, plus 1 is 19, plus 2 is 21, plus 6 is 27. So this will give you the final total of 27. Um, we could also make this get an average. We could say your average equals your total divided by length of v in this case, because we don't have to find n. So now we're going to get 27 over 6. So this will walk you through a for loop. The for loop itself, I mean, through an array. So the for loop itself, this part, all that's doing is taking you from the first to the second to the third to the fourth, fifth, and sixth location. It takes you to all the locations. If you have 20,000 locations, it's going to take you to all 20,000 of them, if it's a vector. 
I'm gonna write that in here. Okay, so the for loop only takes you to each location in the vector and um, only takes you to each location in the vector. Everything else there is up to you. It also keeps track of where you are. So I should say only takes you to each location in the vector, comma, and keeps track of where you are. Okay, so the for loop itself is taking each location. It's this variable, in this case we call it i. That variable is um, what is keeping track of where you are. Everything else is up to you. That's the other part I wanted to write on here. So what I mean by that is when you do something like this, total equals total plus v sub i, all the for loop is doing is taking you to each location in this vector, and i is keeping track of where you are in the vector. The rest of it is up to you. So at each location, you're going to do this. So this is the, the code you're going to execute at each location in the vector. So at the first location, you're going to show up here. You're going to take the total, whatever that is, whatever that was before, the first time through it's zero, and you're going to add v sub i. So you're going to go to look in v, look in position one, and add that to the total. The next time through, you're going to do it again. You're going to take the total, whatever that was, now it's two. You're going to look in v at position two now, and you're going to add that to it. So Again, the for loop is just moving you around. It's not actually doing anything except picking you up and putting you in a different place. And then you have work to do in that place. Okay. Now, again, with a single for loop, this only works for a vector. So let's move to a different example now. Now we have a two-dimensional array. Our array is four by three. So our rows, we have one, two, three, and four. For columns, we have one, two, and three. If you take the length of A, this is going to give you the longest dimension. That's going to be four. If it happened that we were, you had a uh, array that was had more columns than rows, so something like this. Something like that. And you took length of m, it would be 4. So length is always going to give you the longest dimension. OK. When we were working with vectors, when we took the length of the vector, that gave us the total number of values in the array. So length of v gave us 6, which is all, which is all we needed. Here we have 12 values in the array. So if we take the length of A, it's going to give us 4. 
That's not 12. That's not all the values. So if we wanted to visit every single location, four is not going to take us to all of them because there are 12. So now we need to instead use the size command. So the way we're going to do that is like this. Okay, now if we set up a for loop, like we did before, so our, a single for loop like this is just going to take us from one to four. So we could look at this as if it's taking us through all the rows. So it's going to look at row one, it's going to look at row two. I'm going to look at row three, I'm going to look at row four. But it's not looking at individual numbers, it's looking at entire rows. So if we want to look at the individual numbers, then we need to do something a little different. So first of all, instead of going to the length of A, we're going to go to the rows explicitly. So one to our total number of rows. Now at each row, we need to look at each number on each row. So we need to go through and look at each of these values. We need this one, this one, and this one when we're on row one. Then when we get to row two, we're going to want to look at this one, and this one, and this one, etc. So we basically, this for loop that we've got set up so far, this is going to take us through um, each of the rows. Once we get to each row, that's all it's doing is taking us to each row. Once we get to each row, then we have more work to do. We have to figure out what we want to do on each row. So that's what the code inside this for loop is going to be. OK, so now we decide what we want to do on each, for, on each row. On each row, we want to go through and visit each individual location. So now we're going to go through and go through and do that on each row. So our, our code on the rows is going to look like this. OK. So now we have this outer for loop here. That's just taking us to each row. Then we have this inner for loop here. This is what we're going to do on each row. So on each row, we're going to walk through each column. Now remember, we're not walking through the entire column. We're just walking through each column on each row. So it's the intersection of the row and the column. Let me go back to the picture here. So if we're on row one, for example, mm, hold on. Okay, so we let's say we are here. We're on row one. So we're looking at these values here. Now we want to go through to, now we're going to go through our inner for loop where our j equals one to columns loop on row one. We're only still looking at row one. That outer for loop says we are on row one. We're not on rows two, three, and four. So when we're going through j equals one through column, going through all the columns, we're only doing it on row one. So we're going to go here, and then here, and then here. Then we can do whatever we want at each of those locations. That's what our code in here is for. We get to do whatever we want to do at each of those locations. Um, what we've talked about mostly so far is we're going through and adding them up. So we could do that. We could uh, initialize the total and do total equals total plus a i j. Can we call it a? Yeah, I call it a. So total equals total plus a i j. So it's Essentially the same thing we did before, but now our 
system for walking through each location is a little different. Now we need one for loop to get to each row and then another for loop to get to the individual values. If we add a third dimension, we'd need one more for loop to also cover each layer. So there's a lot that go, kind of goes into this. But keep in mind, again, all your for loops are doing are is moving you around within your array in this case. The uh, variable that you define in your for loop is keeping, a tra keeping track of where you are. But all the stuff that you're doing, things like this, you actually have to be doing this work. That's up to you. But conveniently, you have your i and j values. That's where that's your where you are in your for loop. So you can use that to help move around. Okay. Any questions? Uh, Professor, is there any way to actually make the system run like the the same thing over and over again, but without having to input every row? So instead of just having to go one row at a time and then having to input um, like J equals this and that, uh, is there a way for it to just put it in once for it to run every row again? Like uh, some individual number in the row? You can. Um... You still end up having to do something like this um, as, as long as you're doing things with for loops. So um, just a kind of disclaimer, there are, there are commands you can issue in MATLAB to flatten out a, a matrix easily and then walk through it with a single for loop. Um, what I'm trying to teach you is a way you could do this that's going to work in any programming language. So MATLAB's got a few kind of special features that you could use to do this. Um, but let's say you move on to Python, for example. Python may not have the same features, but Python will definitely have for loops where you can do exactly this. So, um, so th this is typically the way you do it in a way that's very portable to any language. C++, you can do this in C++, just like this. Slightly different okay. text, but same idea. Um, Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, depending on what you're trying to do. So if you're trying to take a total of any matrix, you can do that with some MATLAB commands. I'll show you those commands just because it's good to know. It's good for error checks. So let's say you want to do the sum of a vector. You just do um, total equals sum v, and that would give you the sum of your vector. Now. If you try to do that on a two-dimensional matrix, so if you did sum A, this will actually give you, um, I can't remember which way it works. It's either going to give you the sum of each row or the sum of each column. I can't remember which one it chooses, but it chooses one of those and sums. And so this one would give you either three or four different sums. Now, if you wanted to get the sum of those, then you could do this sum of the sum of A, and that would give you a, a complete sum. So you still, even, even using built-in commands with MATLAB, you still kind of have to work around two-dimensional arrays because most of these commands are built for vectors. Another thing you could do is convert this into a vector. In fact, why don't I show you how you convert things into a vector? Anybody who's going to take 3,800 with me, this will be on your first homework in that class. So. Good thing to know. How to vectorize a 2D array. So just to kind of show you what we're trying to do here. Let's say we have an array called A. Let's call it M. We already have an A on the board here. We have an array called M. That's going to be. Uh, We want this to end up looking like this. We'll call it MV. That's our array called M, but vectorized. We want it to look like this. So 
So here's how you would do that. For something like this, you'll want to create your own, um, you want to create a new array first. And you want it to be the correct size. So um, now you don't strictly have to do this part, but I'm going to show you anyway with it. So let's say we want to create MB. So first we're going to figure out our rows and columns for M. That's going to give us the rows and columns. And then we want to create MV just as an empty or a matrix full of zeros to start off with. Or ones or rands, whatever you want to pick to create it. But it's a good idea to um, do this first. So we wanted it to, so in our case, we have nine values, three by three. We want nine values in here, so three times three, and then just in one column. Now we can start populating things. OK. With our nested for loops, we can keep track of our row indices and our column indices. But we also need to keep track of the index in this array as well. Our for loops aren't going to do that for us. So we need to keep track of that ourselves. So we do that here. We define our. Um, We define some other value. We'll call it n. And then we'll get, our, get into our for loops here. OK, so now we have three index variables. We have i and j with our for loops. That's going to keep track of our rows and our columns. And then we have n, which is going to keep track of our index in mv. Okay. Now all we need to do is take each of the values in this matrix and copy them over into this one. So we're just making copies now, direct copies. So first we need to advance n to 1 because we want n to start off at 1 here. So n equals n plus 1. Okay, now we're going to start populating MV. So MVN, which is 1 the first time through, is going to be equal to MIJ. So we're taking MIJ, that's 1, 1, that's 1. We're just copying it over to MV1 here. I should be a little more complete about this. Hold on. This should be n comma 1 to make sure it goes in column 1. Always going to be column 1. All right, so now we can walk through this a little bit here real quick. So we'll populate our MV here one at a time. Okay. We'll keep track of I, J, and N as we go. So before we get started, so we'll start off on this line here. N is going to be 0. Then we jump into our for loops. So first we jump into that, this outer for loop for I equals 1 to row. So I is going to start off at 1. OK, so that means we're going to go to row 1. Now, the inner for loop, we're going to start running J. So J going to start off at 1. All right, so the first line inside that for loop, n equals n plus 1. So we're going to cycle n forward by 1. So n becomes 1. Now we're going to go to mij. So that's m11. That's 1. We're going to copy it into mv11. So that's going to go here, 1. Now we go to j equals 2. When we get to j equals 2, the first thing we do, n equals n plus 1. So now n is going to be 2. OK, now we go to mij, or m12, which is 2. We're going to copy it into mv21. So mv2, so that's going to be our 2. Now we're going to cycle j forward again to 3. 
First thing we do, n equals n plus 1, so n becomes 3. Then we look at m13 and copy that over into mv3. So we get a 3. Okay. Now we're done with the j's. So we drop back out into our outer for loop and cycle i. So now i becomes 2. And then we start the j for loop again, starting over at 1. Okay. First thing we do in the j for loop, n equals n plus 1. So n is 3 now. We add 1 to it. Now n becomes 4. Okay. Now we look at m21, which is 4. And we add that to, or we copy that over into m4. So we get our 4. And we keep going like this. I'm not going to go through all nine of them. I think that should be enough. Um, so we have to take care of our n counter ourselves but i and j are getting counted by our for loop. So in this way, you can convert your 2D matrix or 2D array into a vector. You can also convert it back the other way. So to go the other way with this, um, all you have to do is take this and this and reverse them. And then you can take your vector and put it back into a two-dimensional matrix. So let's start getting into talking about our activity. So we're going to do a data processing activity using a digital elevation model. First thing you're going to want to do, anytime you get a data file, can anybody remember the first thing I told you you should do when you have a data file? Load in with the data? Even before that. I'll show you. Here's what you do before you load it. Before you do anything with it, open it and look at it. All right. And I know that you know everybody's in MATLAB mode, but even when you're in MATLAB mode, you got to get in reality mode a little bit before you get started. Make sure you actually look at your file and know what's in it before you try to load it. So you have a fair idea of what you should be seeing once you do load it. So um, reality first. Here's reality. Here's what our data file looks like. So again, when you look at a data file, you don't have to go through all these numbers. There are um, a lot of them. Let's see. There are nearly 2 million numbers in here, uh, 1.83 million numbers. You don't want to go through looking at those. The whole reason you're taking this class and learning how to use a programming language is so you can teach your computer to look at these numbers so you don't have to. But even so, it's a good idea to take a quick look at the numbers and just kind of have a fair idea what they look like. You know, I'm seeing a lot of numbers in the range of 140, 135, 134. So I got numbers in the hundreds. If I scroll through, it goes down a little bit. Maybe it goes up somewhere. I don't know. It doesn't really matter. Just important to know we got numbers kind of in, in the hundreds, and we have a lot of them. That way, when I load the numbers in there and start trying to do things with them, I know what values I should be able to see in there, in general, approximately. OK. After we do that, now we want to look at the stuff in the file that's before the numbers. So in this case, we have six pieces of information. We have n calls, n rows, xll and yll corners, cell size, and no data value. OK. So another thing that's good to, a good thing to do when you get a data file is you know, don't just take a random data file. Actually, I have a fair idea of what it is. So this is a digital elevation model. What a digital elevation model is is basically a grid where each grid square has a number associated with it. That number represents the elevation above sea level in this case, in meters. So we have a fairly large grid here with a bunch of elevations in it. Now we have a bunch of information about the grid up at the top here. So n calls and n rows, that's telling you how many rows and columns of data we have, how many numbers we should expect. So um, if this 
data set was in a matrix or an array in MATLAB already, and you ran the size command, you should get these numbers telling you how many rows, how many columns you have. So that's good. The next two, these are the corner, this is the lower left corner of the data set. And it's telling you, these are uh, universal transverse Mercator coordinates, telling you where those are. So if you wanted to set this up on a map and georeference this data set, that's how you would do it, because you know where the lower left corner is in UTM coordinates. We're not going to do that. We're not going to deal with those numbers at all, but good things to know. So next one, cell size. So I told you that a, a DEM is a grid, and each grid square has a number representing the elevation of that number. Cell size tells you how big each grid square is. This is in meters. So each grid square represents an area that is 9.477339155339382 by 9.47 blah 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 meters squared. It's a square, that's the size of the square. This last one, no data value. A um, little bit of background on what happens here. Most digital elevation models come from um, some kind of remotely sensed data. So uh, some of them are derived from aircraft flights using a radar system to figure out the elevations. Others are done in a similar way, but with satellites. Um, so you get satellite data. Typically, at least for the entire, I believe, North America, or at least the uh, continental United States, um, there's some data sets that were measured using the space shuttle. Um, the data is called SRTM data. And these are usually the, those are the, the best elevation data sets you can find for the United States. It's using this SRTM data. Um, SRTM data gets you resolution around 10 meters. So I believe what we're looking at here is from SRTM data. Now, when you're collecting data from an airplane or a satellite or a space shuttle, occasionally you might miss a point. This is, you know, part of part of the realities of data collection. We're collecting millions of points. We're collecting the entire continental United States at 10 meter resolution. You're going to miss one here and there. So that's what this no data value is. Wherever there's a point missed or a point that while well, the data was being reviewed was found to be a, an errant data point, it gets replaced with a value. No data value tells you what that value is. So if you were to search these 1.8 million numbers in here, you might find a negative 99.99. That means, that does not mean the elevation at that point is just about 10,000 meters below sea level because that doesn't exist on land in the United States, so, or in the world, in fact. The lowest point in the world is about uh, 1,300 feet below sea level in the Dead Sea in Israel. That translates to about uh, 400 meters below sea level. So negative 99.99, that's obviously an incorrect number. That's what they use on these data sets to, or this data set, to tell you if you have a piece of information that's not in the correct place. So you have all this information just reading out of your data file here. So these are all very good things to know. And you're going to need some of this information in order to process the data. So that's why it's important to open up your data file and read it, because oftentimes you'll get pertinent information built into the data file. Now, we could actually teach MATLAB how to read all this information out of the header. We're not going to do that. That's a little more advanced than anything I want to deal with. But we will have to read this data file. <clears throat> so let's get to reading a data file. This is kind of your import data review. Uh, with this header information, you can't just use the load command to read the data file. You have to use import data in order to, because you don't want to delete that. That's all really important good stuff. So if you delete it, it's gone. Now you don't know your cell size. You don't, you don't know your no data value. You have lost a whole bunch of important information. So we got to leave that alone. We'll use import data to read this. Okay. Now I got to teach you a little bit of extra stuff with import data, and I'll show you why. 
Oops. There we go. Clean that up a bit. Okay, so I'm going to start my DEM processor. Okay, so normally when you read a file like this, you're going to use the import data command. So something like A equals import data. Can everybody see the, the, my MATLAB screen well? I'm just kind of looking at my iPad. It's kind of small. Okay, let me know if you can't see it and I can switch over to something else. So just send something to the chat if you're having trouble seeing anything here. Okay, that's the normal command you would usually use to import your data. So we're going to hit run. It's going to make me save this. Okay, when I run it, now I can go look over in my workspace, and I should see A in the workspace, and it should be called a one by one struct. Now, Going back to looking at the data file, clearly this is not one by one. There's a lot of data here. So we're not there yet, and that's fine. That's normal. That's how import data usually works. So usually the second command that I use is I'll actually pull the data out using A. So this is the same variable I used to name everything when I did import data. That's not changing. A dot data. That's going to get us or should bring in our data. So now I'm going to hit run again. By the way, you can you can you can do this anytime you're writing code. You can write a command, hit run, write a command, hit run, and make sure it all works. I do it all the time that way. Okay, so now I have DEM in the workspace and it is uh, 913,410 by one. So let's go back and look at our data set here. Our data set right here, it says it's 1,236 columns, 1,478 rows. Over here in our workspace, we have, for what we thought was supposed to be our data set, we have 913,410 rows and one column. Those don't match. Not only do those no, not match, but if we multiply these numbers together, 1,236 by 1,478, that should give us the total number of values we should have. Whoops, hold on. I typed it wrong. That happens sometimes. So 1236 times 1478 is 1,826,808. That's how many data values we should have. We have 913,410. So that's an immediate red flag right there that we don't have the right, that we haven't read the data correctly. So you got to be a little careful about that and watch out for those things, especially with large data sets. If we know how much data we have, and we do because it's in our header file, then we can watch what happens in our workspace as we load the data and figure out if things are wrong. In this case, they are. And the reason for that is um, we've could, import data has gotten confused. Import data is confused because we have letters and numbers mixed on the same rows with spaces and things like that, and we've managed to confuse our import data command. So you can take a little more control of import data, and you can tell it some of this information. So normally import data figures out what's header and what's data, skips the header, and goes straight to the data. But it couldn't do that this time. So now we need to tell it ourselves. So there's a couple of other things we can add to the import data command. Um, typically, we just give it the file name. But you can actually work your command like this. So the first thing is the file name. Then, then you can 
add some things to it. So that's our typical usage. But now we're going to add a few things. So after the file name, put a comma. And then in single quotes after that comma, we put what's called the delimiter. The delimiter is the uh, character that's used to separate data values from each other in the file. So in our data file, each of these data values, we have 138.776779 space, 139264755 space. So the space is how our data values are separated here. So delimiter is another word for a separator. So for our import data that we're going to use, we put a comma after the file name, and then in single quotes, put a space to tell it that we are separating our values by spaces. Other common characters to use to separate values are commas. That's the probably the other most common character, that in spaces. Uh, sometimes semicolons, sometimes tabs. Um, in the event that it's a tab, the way you'd signify a tab in here is backslash T. But for our case, it's spaces. So we'll leave that alone. OK, so that's the delimiter. Now the other thing, looking at our data set, the other, all, other thing we have to tell it is how many lines we have before the data starts. In this case, it's six. So that comes next. Uh, lines to skip. So this is going to be a number of how many lines we want import data to skip before it starts reading just the data itself. So that's six. So your import data command for this data set is going to look like this. It's going to have all these other things in it in addition to just the file name. So if we run it that way, I'm going to hit run again. Now our, now our uh, DEM matrix is 1478 by 1236. So going back to our file here, 1478 rows, 1236 columns. So now we're in good shape. We've managed to read our data properly. So that was kind of just, I wanted to give you a little walk through on how you might, how, how you should be approaching things when you get a data file. You should read it and do some checking on it first before you start trying to do any analysis. Make sure you read it correctly. Because otherwise, we'd be diving in here with um, something that had something that was short by about half the numbers. It was supposed to be um, 1.8 million numbers, and we were only coming up with uh, 914,000 numbers. So make sure you get this part figured out first before you start trying to do any data analysis. But now we've got our data read in properly. And now we can start doing a few things. So I mentioned before, you could program your MATLAB code to actually read in some of these numbers. Um, we're not going to do that. We're just going to copy it. But one of, them, one of the ones we're going to need for this analysis we're going to do, we're going to need this cell size. So I'm going to copy that. I'm just going to straight up copy and paste it into my code. Hit copy, jump over to our code here. I'm going to call this, uh, I'm going to call it resolution. And that's equal to that number I just copied. So again, the resolution is the uh, size of each of the squares for which we have elevation values. Okay. Questions so far? Okay. So this is kind of the stuff to start off with to just manage your data file. What we want to do next, I'm going to go back onto the whiteboard and we're going to kind of start talking about a few of the things we want to do. Actually, before we do that, why don't, we, why don't we dive into some activity time and have you guys do some of this so you can you know, stretch your MATLAB legs a little bit. So the first thing I want you to do is I want you to go through this data set and 
count up how many times you encounter that uh, bad or that no data value. So this negative 99.99. Um, I'm going to tell you now before you do it, you're not going to find any. This data set's already been corrected. Um, but I want you to write the code that would actually go through and look for that value. So that's going to be your first task here. Let's break this up into a couple of pieces here. So this first task, there's a couple of things in here. First, there's go through the data set. That's, that's one uh, operation right there. And then counting how many grid squares have the no data values of it. We could treat, almost treat that as a separate operation. So going through the data set, that's our for loops. That's the how we're going to get to each location. Then counting how many grid squares have the no data value, that's the thing that we're going to do at each location. Um, then eventually this task number two, that's another thing we're going to do at each location. So those are sort of things we'll set up here. So let's drop down right below this picture I drew, which we'll talk about in a minute, and start going through our data set. OK, so that's. That's for loops to go through the data set. Okay, just to clean this up, let's put my rings on here. Okay, so this is all we need to do to, to go through our data set. We create our for loops that are going to walk us through the rows and the columns. For this case, I put rows on the inside and columns on the outside. It doesn't really matter at this point which one you pick. Um, traditionally, when you're dealing with a geographic data, whatever's on your x-axis is on the inner for loop. Whatever's on your y-axis is on your outer for loop. If it's a three-dimensional data set, then whatever is on your z-axis would be another outer for loop. So it goes outer z, y, x in that direction. That's just kind of a traditional way of setting things up when you're dealing with the geographic data set. Um, there's reasons to do it that way that, um, well, I'm not really going to get into them right now, but there are, it's, it's done that way on purpose. It's not just um, arbitrary. We'll leave it at that for now. Okay, so now we've set up go through the data set. Now we want to count how many grid squares have that no data value. So first thing we'll do is we'll define our no data value. We'll call it no data and it's negative 99.99. ,99. Okay, and then we're going to keep a count of how many times we see that. We'll call it n bad for number of bad data values. Before we start looking, we have zero n bad values. So 
once we get in here, maybe we'll find some. Here's how we're going to check. So we're going to look in our data set now. If DEMIJ, so our current location in DEM, is equal to our no data value, then we will cycle our counter. All right, that takes care of task one. By the time these two for loops are done, if we look up what n bad is, it should give us the number of times that number was encountered. So we can go ahead and run this. And it turns out n bad is zero. I already told you that was what it was going to be. So hopefully that's not a surprise to anybody. OK. So now let's look at task number two. For task number two, I want you to correct any of these no data value points. Of course, there are zero, so it doesn't really matter. But assuming I hand you another data set that has them, um, we want to correct it by averaging the four surrounding grid squares. So our current grid square is IJ. That's E-M-I-J. So the four gr surrounding grid squares, we're going to have the ones below and above and left and right. So below is going to be uh, J minus 1. Above would be J plus 1. Left would be I minus 1. Right would be I plus 1. So this all is on row J. This all is on column. I'm sorry. This. Yeah, this is all on column J. This is all on row I. I realize I've got rows and columns reversed here as far as row and column is concerned. But it's better to think about these in terms of x values. So the x value here on all three of these is I. The y value on these guys is J on all three of those. So. Think of i and j as x and y values, or x and y indices. We can get into coordinate transforms and whether or not they're necessary later. And by later, I mean in 3800. I have a nice discussion about this then. OK, so what we want to do is look above and below, left and right, and get those all four of those values and take the average of those four values. That's going to be our value here if we have a no data value there. So I'm going to kind of do this in a simplistic way first. And then we'll talk a little bit about how we can um, make it a little more robust. So the simple way first. So if DEMIJ is equal to no data, we're going to add it to our count. And now we're going to go through and find this average. So DEMIJ is going to be equal to um, DEMIJ minus 1 plus DEMI minus 1J. So we've got down and left. Now we're going to do right, i plus 1, j. Now we're going to do up. Put all those in parentheses, divide by 4. Now you've got the average. OK. <clears throat> so again, this is the. Simplistic approach makes a lot of assumptions. <clears throat> These are the assumptions we're making here by setting this up. So we've just taken the four surrounding values, added them together, divided by four. That's the average. And that's cool, but it makes the following assumptions. First, we are assuming that all four of these values exist. So if we are on the bottom, the bottom, where y equals 1, so if this is the bottom here, then this grid square doesn't exist. Right? Actually, I'm going to jump on the whiteboard. It's going to be easier to draw this on the whiteboard. So give me just a second here to flip that over.
I'm going to draw a little grid here. Okay, so let's say we are, we are here. We found that at this grid square, the value was negative 99.99. So that means it's a piece of bad data. <clears throat> so in order to replace that piece of bad data with a reasonable number, we're going to take the value here, 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 and here. We're going to take the average of those four values. And we're going to use that to um, replace this negative 99.99 with something reasonable. This is a, a pretty standard way of doing data correction in a digital elevation model. Now, when we do this, we are making an assumption here right off the bat. We are assuming that all four of these data values are valid. So we're assuming that none of these are equal to negative 99.99. So let's draw some pictures here. not equal to negative 99.99. So we're making that assumption first of all. The other assumption that we're making is a little different. But let's, let's, let's deal with this assumption first. So what we need to do is, so we don't necessarily want to be able to make that assumption. What if, what if we had this data set, let's say all, all three of these guys here we're all negative 99.99. Well, then taking this average wouldn't work very well. Doesn't matter about this one, but the other one here, there we go. That would be a problem. So we want to maybe eliminate that. So we could set it up so we check each of these, and if they're equal to negative 99.99, they get skipped from our averaging system. So that's a thought. So something like if uh, DEM I J plus one, I'm not leaving myself much room here. There we go. Is not equal to no data. Then, then we can add it to our average. Or something like that. Obviously, include an average. That's not a valid MATLAB command, but we write our own command for that. Now, the other assumption that we're making, the other set of assumptions, is that all four of the surrounding values exist. That's also that's a valid assumption if you're in any of these grid squares. But let's say you're in this grid square here. Well, here, the surrounding grid squares, there's only three surrounding grid squares, here, here, and here. This is not a grid square. That doesn't exist. So we can't include that in the average, because how would you include something that doesn't exist in an average? Same thing if we were up here. If this was our grid square here, again, same problem. We have this one, this one, and this one, but nothing here. And if we're in the corner, it's even more of an issue. If we're here, we only have this grid square and this grid square, but this one and this one don't exist. So we want to deal with all of these particular cases. So the way we want to do that is instead of just adding the four surrounding things, we need to make sure they exist and aren't negative 99.99 before we try to add them. So let's jump back over to the code here. So I'm going to comment out this line because it's problematic. We'll do something else instead here. Okay. 
So here's what we'll do. The first thing we're going to do when we find out that DEMIJ equals no data, that means it's got a negative 9999. That means we don't actually have a value in there at all. So we're just going to reset it to zero. OK, that's a start. Now we're going to start fixing it a little bit. So we'll start with an if statement here. If DEM I J minus 1. So we're going to start looking downward first. If this value is not equal to our no data value, then we'll do something with it. But before we do that, let's make sure it even exists first. So if, sorry, take that out of my way for a second. Actually, I'm just going to, I'll delete, it'll come back. Let's make sure that that grid square below us exists first. So we're looking down first. So if um, j minus 1 is greater than 0. So if j is 1, j minus 1 is 0. And that's a problem. So that's the first thing we'll check. And we're also going to check and make sure that the value is not um, not equal to our uh, no data value. OK. Now we'll add it to our, our value here. The other thing we want to keep track of is how many values we're actually going to use here. So normally it's four, but if we eliminate any of them, we have to bring that number down from four. So we'll keep a little counter here as well. Uh, we'll call it n average. This is the end we're going to divide our average by. And we'll keep track of that as well. So n equals n plus one. OK. So that takes care of the first of the four values. Now we need to do the same code for the other three. So now we'll look at the left side. Now let's do up first. So we did down, now let's do up. So if j plus 1 is less than or equal to our highest number, which is ny. OK. So downwards, we wanted to make sure that we're basically just making sure that our array index for j is something that exists in our matrix. So um, j goes from 1 to 1,236. So we want to make sure that j is not less than 1, because that's the beginning. We also want to make sure that j is not less than, uh, or is not greater than, 1,236. So that's ny is our 1,236. So we just want to make sure that the uh, value above, this one here, is not out of bounds. That's all we're checking here. Let's make sure this stays in bounds. And then the other thing, we're going to check the same thing again. And DEM uh, I, J, this time it's plus one because we're looking up not equal to our no data value. And again, we'll do the same stuff in here. DEM IJ equals DEM IJ plus DEM IJ plus one. Oops, this was supposed to be an average. Okay. 
Now we're going to do that two more times. This time it's going to be for the x direction instead. So we'll do this time if i minus 1 greater than 0. So same idea as what we did here for j minus 1. And dem, dem i minus 1j not equal to no data. Then one more. Okay, so this goes through. Now, we've gone through all four directions. We've done down, up, left, right, and made sure it was possible to add the number to our average. But now we still need to calculate the average. So the last part is DEMIJ equals DEMIJ divided by the N average that we were counting up as we went along. So now we've eliminated the assumptions that we made down here. Uh, next file is at four. Oh, sorry. Uh, taking care of the child in addition to taking care of you guys. But you guys can take care of yourselves. Um, Like I was saying, this approach down here that I've commented out, it's a simplistic approach, makes the assumptions that all of these values that we're adding to our moving average are existing and not bad data. This approach up here is going through and eliminating all those assumptions. So it's using some if statements to make sure that the values both exist and are not uh, equal to that no data value before it includes it in that moving average. Okay. So one other thing that I did not include here. So I've still made one assumption in here that we have not yet eliminated. Can anybody see what that assumption is? I'll give you a hint. It's on this line here and that part of this line right here. Okay, here's what the assumption is. I'm dividing by n average. So here I define n average as equal to zero. Then in each of these if statements, I add one to it. But if none of these if statements are ever true, by the time it gets down here, an average is still going to be zero. And then this will divide by zero. So we are assuming that at least one of the adjacent values to our no data value, we're assuming that at least one of those is a valid number that exists. If, if we have a piece of bad data completely surrounded by other pieces of bad data, 
then we're going to run into a problem here because this is going to be a divide by zero. So we can add one more little if statement here. If an average greater than zero, then we'll do this. Otherwise, we have a problem. We can't really run otherwise. So I'm going to put an else in here and throw an error. Too much missing data. You can write your own error message, whatever you want this to say. But this last bit kind of goes through and kind of covers all your bases. So here's what I'm trying to show you here. We have this nice simplistic approach that works under probably, I'd say 99% of the circumstances this would work. What you have to do when you write something like this is think about when this won't work. So figure out a few ideas of when something you're trying to do is not going to work. And then you want to eliminate those possibilities so your code can keep working around some of these problems. So we figured out that if any of these numbers are also bad data, then this is going to provide a poor average because if all the numbers are supposed to be around 135 and one of these numbers ends up being negative 9,999, it's going to throw your average off by a lot. So you want to eliminate that. The other problem is if any one of these values does not exist, then um, MATLAB is going to give you an error. And then you haven't solved your problem either. So those are kind of some things to look for. Always be on the lookout for what might cause an error and try to find a way to eliminate that error from stopping your program from running. That's that's kind of the, the more difficult side of debugging. So when MATLAB doesn't run, it gives you a, a message on the screen that says, um, you know, message on the screen in red that says things didn't work on this line. Those are easy to fix. You go to that line, you fix it, and then you continue. But when the pro when the co when the problem is part of the your coding strategy itself, that's when you start running into more difficult things to solve. And I don't expect anybody to be kind of right off the bat finding and, and figuring out what all the possible problems are. But that's sort of a, a big part of debugging is trying to identify areas where, you're, where your program might not work the way you intend it to. Here. The third task is going to be the hard one. And we're going to spend the rest of the class time working on it. But I need to explain how it works first. So task three. Task number three, you're going to find the slopes. Find the slopes in the topography in the x and y directions. So let's say I have just two grid squares. And the elevations in these grid squares are 135. And 137. If I want to find the slope between those two grid squares, we're going to go back to some early mathemat mathematical stuff we've done prior to coming to college. The slope equal to the rise over run. So the rise in this case is going to be the change in elevation. So it's going to be, we'll call this uh, Z1 and Z2. So the rise equals Z2 minus Z1. The run is going to be the distance between those two measurements. Now, the way a digital elevation model works is the measurement represents the elevation at the center of the grid square. So the run is going to be a distance between the centers of the grid squares. That's going to be this distance. Too far. 
That's going to be this distance. That's our run. So how do we estimate what that distance is? Well, we know how big these grid squares are. I, I drew them as rectangles, and I apologize for that. These are squares. Let's just uh, postulate that these are squares. We know this length and this length. We know those are the same length. And but that's given in the data set. That is the cell size in the data set. I'm just going to call it um, I'm going to call it L because it's easier to write on the board here, L. Okay. So that's the cell size, which from our data set we know is um, 9.4773 dot dot dot. We have it out to a good long set of decimal places. So we know that value. We know L. We know this is also L. We also know that the distance from the edge to the middle, that's going to be one half of L. And the distance from this middle to that edge is one half of L. So conveniently enough, the distance between the cell grid cell centers, which was in green here, that distance is L for our cell size. Cool. So our run is just going to be equal to that cell size, which is given. We already have that number. So our slope I'm going to say slope x, because this is our slope in the x direction, is z2 over z1 divided by the cell size. OK. That's how we calculate our slope. Now, let's say we have more grid squares. Now we got eight grid squares. Obviously, we're going to have a lot more than that. We're going to have uh, 1,478 of them, but nobody wants to watch me draw that on the board. It'll take all day just to make the grid. Each of these values, each of these grid squares is going to have an elevation. We want to find the slope between each of them. So we want to find the slope between these two, the slope between these two, and all of these. So we want to find slopes between every pair of grid squares. Now, notice this. We have eight grid squares. Slopes in between them, we only have seven. So we're kind of, we're working with pairs here. So the first thing we'll do, we're going to find a slope between this pair. Then we're going to find a slope between this pair, then this pair, this pair, this pair, this pair, and this pair. So we only go through one. So we start off with grid cell one plus the next one, then grid cell two plus the next one, then grid, I should be drawing on here. So grid cell one plus the next one, which is two, then grid cell two plus the next one, which is three, and then three plus the next one, which is four, and four plus the next one, which is five, and five plus the next one is six, six plus the next one is seven, and um, seven plus its neighbor is eight. But we don't do anything with eight. So as we loop through these, even if we have eight grid squares, so we'll call that nx equals eight, even if we have eight, our for loop to go through to make these slopes in that x direction, it's going to go from one to our nx minus 1, because it's only going to go up to 7 to find the slopes. Does that make sense? OK. We're going to do the same thing in the y direction. So in the y direction, We're not going to do quite as many. We're going to want to find the slopes here 
in between each of these. So if there's five grid squares in Y, we're going to find five or four slopes in Y. Again, it's going to be the same calculation. So we have um, Z1 and Z2. That's our slope, or that's our, our rise. So the slope in Y will be Z2 minus Z1, just like before, divided by the cell size, which is conveniently the same in X and Y. So we'll make that calculation for this pair of grid squares first, then this pair, and then this pair, and then this pair. So for five grid squares, we make four calculations. So that means in X, if we have 1,478 grid squares, we're going to make 1,477 slope calculations in the X direction. And in the Y direction, we have 1,236 grid squares, 1,235 slope calculations. So our, our loop for each of those will go to, to N minus 1. So now let's put this all together for the entire grid. Again, not going to draw the complete grid. I'm just going to draw a small version of it and kind of show you what we're calculating. OK. Each grid square at its center has an elevation, which is measured at the center of the grid square. Forgive me while I draw all these in. It's going to be handy. So this cell-centered grid square, or cell-centered grid, has one value for every grid square. One value for every grid square. And that grid is NX by NY. So this is X, this is Y. We typically save that in MATLAB in this way. X is your rows, Y is your columns. Obviously, that's not what it looks like, but that's how we save it. OK. This cell-centered grid, it's also sometimes known as the mass grid. That comes from uh, numerical weather modeling, where um, air masses are recorded as cell-centered values. Um, also in numerical weather modeling, in addition to modeling the location of air masses and moisture masses and things like that, you also model air movement. And that shows up on what's called a staggered grid. We're going to have two staggered grids. We're going to have a staggered grid in the x direction and another one in the y direction. So the x direction scattered grid is going to be slopes in between pairs of values. Mm, hold on a second. I'm going to use a different color so it's easier to see. This is our X staggered grid that I'm drawing here. This is where we're going to calculate the slopes in the X direction. I'll call it slope X. Slope X is a staggered grid. Notice that in the y direction, we have five values. So on our, our cell-centered mass grid, we had five values in the y direction, six values in the x direction. For our slope x staggered grid, 
we still have five values in the y direction, but now we only have five values in the x direction. So the slope x staggered grid is going to be uh, nx minus one by ny. We're also gonna have a staggered grid in the y direction. So notice with that, we'll call this our slope y. So slope y has six values in the x direction, which is the same as the mass grid, but it's only got four values in the y direction, which is the staggered grid. So it's going to be nx by ny minus one. So we've got three separate grids here. We're going to calculate the values that go into these two staggered grids here using the values in our mass grid here. Okay, so you've got all the tools now. You have everything you need to calculate the slope. It's just going to be um, the next value minus the current value divided by the cell size. Now you just want to take that calculation and move it around through your entire grid to find your slopes. So you're going to find them separately. Slope X is one matrix. Slope Y is a completely different matrix. So you have these, or you have your mass grid already. That's what you read in from the file. So that's your next part of the task is to start calculating these slopes. What you might want to do is um, you know, write code to just calculate one slope first and then expand it outwards. So kind of like the way I showed it on the board here. We calculated just one first here. Then we moved it on to a whole row. Then, then we did a, looked at a column also. And then we moved on to looking at the entire grid. So doing it kind of piecewise like that is a good way to start.